Hello and welcome along to Penwith Radio. I'm Rob Jenkins and this is Lasting Memories, part of the All Our Stories project in association with the Heritage Lottery Fund. There was once a time when it was said that you could walk across the harbours of both Newlyn and Mausel upon the decks of Cornish luggers without so much as touching the water. And these fishing boats indeed had a huge influence on the lives of the men and women of the Cornish fishing villages of Cornwall. John Lamborn explains that the design of the vessels goes way back beyond even the Roman invasion of Gaul. Leon Pesach, the founder of the Sea Salts and Sail Festival in Mausel, explains how he believes the mining greatly influenced the expansion of the Cornish lugger fleets. And I think it's interconnected with mining, really, because I believe mining was from about 1780 to about 1880 really prospered. So places like St. Just, instead of a farming area, there was suddenly thousands of men mining. 
and they have to be fed. Um, so what better is that than fish? So with the coming of mining, there was more money and the Mosel fleet and others could expand then, make more profit, buy bigger boats, catch more fish. And the men I knew who had, when I was in a child, we had, they then moved on to motor boats and they went up to about 48 foot long instead of, I'm not sure I knew this was more like about 40 foot. They, um, they had their boats built probably 1910, 1920. But they were very proud people. They would, they, you know, because and particularly if a union boat coming up overtaking you, you would open up a throttle to make sure they didn't pass you. You know, and if they caught ten ton of uh, ten stone of fish, you want twenty stone. Um, in the eighteen ninety six fishes exhibition in London, they asked a Mosel man, the first VC, Mr. Tawavis, uh to go open open it. He turned the offer down, and that was taken up by one Mr. Pesak. And my sister has got his walking stick somewhere. He, he went up there and opened it. And at the time, they reckoned the Mounts Bay fishing fleet was the fastest in the world, they said at the time. I think it's better than the Scottish, because I, I understand with Scotland, 1880, there was a huge storm. Well, of course, Gondi Island was a disaster up there, because the Highland clearances, the owner kicked all the people out and built little bungalows or one-story buildings and built harbors for them and he went fishing in open boats and in the North Sea he gets a different sea there's a very wind against a strong tide and there's a very short sea and he lost a lot of boats one night um, so our boats when he went to Ireland from 1830 onwards and then the island man they were building luggers called Nickies and Nobbies so I know the Cornish design was an improvement of what they did. So they then copied the Cornish design. Several boats from here were sold to Ireland, and then they would sail to the Caledonia Canal to Peter Ed, for St. Ives boats, I believe. And uh, our, our boats mainly, mainly went to Whitby, so you could have 40 or 50 boats in Whitby Harbour. Yeah, I think there was mainly PE boats, would have been, or PZ boats, with the Bay. I believe the St. Ives ones tend to go over to Scotland. Right. So, um, so as they got they got fine on the waterline copying these yachts and going faster so it was important to get to the boat then so now then when the train come um well you had even had better service so you want to get back to the dance market to get the train to get your fish to billingsgate uh, so it become very efficient and there's a saying every time you went to sea it was like a regatta if your next door neighbor was coming up in his boat behind you they were very proud people there's no way you would let them pass you so you tweak your sails and think well when I build a new boat I'm going to alter it a little bit to make it a bit faster
Despite the difficulties of being a lugger fisherman, faith played a large part in the lives of the men at sea, and Sundays being a day of no work, they would come into land when they could. Uh, and also, they all went to church. Because I know one of them was uh, a very good soloist, and they wore very, very heavy clothes because there was no heating on board, apart from a little cooking stove. And when you're at sea, you, you, you couldn't get that keep that going. And uh, went to church on Sundays, and he always sing a solo in the, in the church up there. And he took his best suit with him. The rest of them, having been aboard a boat full of, if you've ever been on the puzzle driver, obviously there was fish getting squashed going down the bilges, which were pumped out. But there was quite a strong odour on board with chewed tobacco, <laughs> rotten pilchards, you know. Um, and uh, he, yeah, he took his best suit and he put his best suit and it would have been kept in the box and the wires in that chair. He must have, obviously after a month, it would be wet, deviant as it was salt. He couldn't keep, possibly keep it dry. Went to church and got a death of gold and died. Then when they when the herring season come, they were going to Sanal. He just started there, follow the mackerel to Ireland, Isle of Man, then to Caledonian Canal, up to Whitby, um, then come back home, and then I know in the winter they used to go then to Plymouth, I believe it was Big Bree Bay, where the herring used to breed. Lugger fishing was often an endeavour of the whole community, and although only the men went to sea, the mothers and wives often played a vital role in the distribution of the fish and the management of the boats.
and the women were involved in the fishing as well, that they, most of the houses in places like Mousel were two stories high, and in the back they would have a probably two story building open underneath where they processed their own catch. The woman would put it on the back and walk around the parishes and sell it on the back, or save it in cellars like we got at the back and put it on the ground and high, uh, in a pile as high as you could reach, say five foot high, with salt for a month, then process it in barrels and export it to Spain. Um, later on, it got more commercial and then they built buildings called, in Mabigizzi, called fish palaces. We call ours fish cellars. So they were stored in big tanks. Tanks would be the size of this room. So there's got a uh, building across the road which he's trying to get raise money for for a village hall. There's what, 10 tanks, 10 tanks there. And each tank was probably all about 20 tons of filters. So they all put in their own salt. And after a month, they'd be taken out and then lifted upstairs and rather than squashed with a lever principle, which I can demonstrate outside, they were squashed by, by screwing them down. The women of the community would be carrying out the work, often during times when their husbands and sons were at sea, and they would have no idea when they would be coming home, if indeed they were coming home at all. Sixty-five, eighteen, and seventy. If we look at the West Britain, seventy thousand Cornishmen left Cornwall one year, plus families. They had special trains from the Druze, four in one day, to take people away. For the men and women who were left behind, religion played an increasing part in their lives. And another day, I, it was a story that grandmothers used to tell me: a boat coming flying a yellow flag for a, a disease on board. So the old. Methodism was very strong there. The vast majority of people were very religious. And they went aboard, and the, the pilot said, well, when we go aboard, plenty of chew tobacco, and ch spit chew tobacco in all directions, and then we won't catch this disease. <laughs> At one stage, Methodism was so strong there, I believe they signed sort of an oath to, to be a Christian, non-alcoholic, etc., and they would give the all the fish caught in one of their nets. I am sure that would probably be about one twentieth of their catch to the church. So they got the small village here, but they got a chapel down there which holds eight hundred and fifty people. There was another one up there that holds four hundred people. So in Cornwall, we look at the big mining towns, St. Just, Bridgeville, Camborne, and the fishing towns, St. Ives and places like Mousel. The, that's where the biggest chapels were, because all these people got very religious. So in the days of the sale, it was either a feast or famine. You either had a lot of money or none at all. And I mean, I got ground now. We've had since eighteen since eighteen seventy. My grandfather, great grandfather Harvey, I know he had a, a forty odd foot fishing boat with seven crew, but he also had about a quarter of a half an acre of. Uh, market gardens and to this day I, I, I still work my garden my parents did and my grandparents did 
The sailing lugger had provided fishing communities with a livelihood for many generations, but in the end its decline was inevitable. Many of the luggers at this time were broken up or pressed into other usage, and the Ripple's history reflected the fate of the boats in general, and in many ways it was a miracle that she survived.
but with this net they were cottoned and they were treated in cutch or bark of a, an oak tree sometimes creosote and when it was salt water in the summer they would overheat and could catch on fire that's obviously what must have happened there and he must have been sleeping on board I know my grandfather Pazak spent a lot of time yachting but I know that sometimes he was home I know one year he was dense and eyes living aboard a boat for the season probably the airing season and then come on weekends he just lived aboard the boat the rest of the time so Paul Humphreys must have been doing the same thing he woke up was on fire and uh, the boat burnt there but he managed to get away yeah uh, John said his thoughts oh well he's probably drunk I said what <laughs> you mustn't mention that to families because these people in alcohol has never passed their lips might have chewed tobacco uh, but certainly wouldn't have um, drunk any alcohol Eventually the Ripple was sold to the Tomlin brothers, who converted her to a gentleman's launch and took her up to the Helford River. Whilst many of the Cornish luggers had been broken up or dragged up creeks to rot peacefully, up on the, Helford River. the French, who had lost almost all of their original boats, began making replicas that inspired men like Mike House and his friend to start the Mounts Bay Lugger Association. This was a fate that befell many of the Cornish luggers, and indeed a similar fate befell the luggers of France. The French, concerned that they had almost no original luggers left, embarked on a programme of building replica luggers, and these in turn inspired men like Mike House to found the Mounts Bay Lugger Association. It all started with the... 90, in 1992, the French held a big classic boat festival. Uh, they'd already held one of the previous years but this year they really made a big, big effort they had the councils uh, the French councils put the money forward to have boats built of the different areas of France we went to this festival and we thought there's no Mount Bay luggers represented here and there were boats from all over the world there apart from the French themselves boats from America Scandinavia so we thought we better do something about it because up until the 1900s there was probably something like four or five hundred luggers working out of Mounts Bay. We thought first of all the ideal thing would be to build a replica. We had to raise the interest and raise the money. That was really really difficult. This is 1993 that we started this. We got a hold of a boat which really didn't suit our, suit our purpose. It would have been okay but we felt there were better boats around. So we had another look around, and in the end we found Happy Return. Now Happy Return was the last working fishing boat 
oldest Peruvian fishing boat in the country. She was due to be decommissioned, renovated Christmas 98. I Ministry of Agriculture and Food at the time, to cut a long story short, felt that it was probably too valuable to cut up. She was built in Port 11 in 1904 and went to Folkestone to replace a boat that was lost in a gale. And that boat, the previous boat, which was called the um, Good Intent, she was also a, uh, a lugger that was built in Port 11. We knew very well we had to replace the decks. Of course, once we took the decks out, we allowed ourselves a day to take the decks out. We took them up in 20 minutes. <laughs> They're just like paper. So we, um, we got, the, uh, got the decks out, and then we could see then there was a lot more work involved, and we more or less had to replace all the woodwork down to the waterline. That took us 27 months. We had the boat in the wet dock in Penzance for about 18 months, a couple of years perhaps. And then we um, got it over to Crowless, got the boat over there by um, the side of factory that was owned by a member of our association. And uh, he was an engineer, so he was able to help quite a bit. And that took us 27 months. And we got the boat more or less in the condition it is now. Although last winter we did replace the keel, which was a big job. And we knew several years ago that would have to be done at some time. Not all lugger owners, though, set out with the intention of becoming lugger owners.
Restoring classic boats is never straightforward, and as was the case with the Ripple, the boat had been through many incarnations during its working life. Of, of other luggers in general, yeah. Because <laughs> fishing in Cornwall was almost in, entirely lug sail, which is a fore and aft sail, yeah, uh, rectangular sail, where because they were drift net fishing, the, the design evolved to be able to go into the wind. They're quite efficient going into the wind, like any other boat ready to sail. It's a catch basically, a two sail boat with a sail aft and a sail forward. It's only the tacking that makes them unique. And the idea of that, I don't know if you've heard it before, but the reason why they're a, a dipping lug is because when the boats were fishing and had their nets out, they could take the mast out of the deck. Well, they certainly lowered it anyhow. It dropped into a, what was known as a crutch, which was like a pole with a horseshoe at the top that the mast dropped down into. When the weather was really bad, the mast was taken out of the deck, laid on the deck. And essentially quite simple.
One of the difficulties facing lugger revivalists is that the technique for sailing the boat, dipping the lug, was not passed on when engines were put in the boats. And we only found out how to do it by reading a section in a book, Edgar March's book, The Sailing Drifters. Right. And there's a page there which explained it right more in quite fine detail how to um, sail a lugger, well, especially to tack and come through the wind.
Having restored a classic boat, keeping it seaworthy presents something of a challenge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. The membership fee keeps that going. Yeah. So therefore, the more people we've got, the more money we've got. We've usually got, well, we've certainly got to paint the boat every year. And then there's ropes to renew. Safety equipment is the most important thing. Life rafts are really expensive. We've had ours 10 years now, and we're renewing them this year. And then the regulations change. So we've got all that to contend with. And that's pricey stuff.
Thank you. 